Hello class, welcome back to our notes on Earth Systems and Resources. This Unit 3C notes is going to unpack a lot of material on atmosphere, weather, and climate. So what makes the conditions in which we live on this planet? Uh, to begin with, the composite, composition of the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, um, is a, a primary focus. Uh, what we do need to know for one of our key standards in our Earth's atmosphere section is the most abundant gas. Our first place winner is right here, nitrogen. Second is oxygen. Okay, This is um, most common misconceptions that you know, we need oxygen, so we assume it's the most abundant gas, and that's not true. Other trace gases in this small little slice of the pie include all of these here. Um, argon being noteworthy, like more abundant than others. Um, other gases you'll hear about later, uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, so we'll talk about those. Uh, methane is a greenhouse gas, so I'm labeling GHG, nitrous oxide, greenhouse gas, and uh, water vapor, greenhouse gas. So four of our five major greenhouse gases are listed here in the smaller chunk of the pie. Um, just noteworthy because when we talk about those things, they even though they're less than 1% of our Earth's um, atmospheric composition, uh, they're uh, making a huge difference in our uh, climate and atmosphere. Moving on, talking about atmosphere, we have a label it. Uh, in our label it section, uh, you'll have this handout um, provided to you. Uh, you should be labeling the layers of the atmosphere and the temperature trends and the density of molecules, which is all highlighted in each section here, all right? Um, and how thick the layers are. Okay, so atmosphere. Um, when we talk about atmospheric structure, you need to know the names of the layers. Uh, the one down at the bottom is troposphere. In the troposphere, it's the, the lowest layer. This is where all our weather occurs. Uh, the temperature trend is as we go up through the troposphere, it tends to get colder. Um, the density of the molecules is highest here. The density trend is decreasing really all the way through. Um, temperature kind of zigzags. So we get into the stratosphere, which is the next layer. Um, the ozone layer is present here. That's noteworthy. That'll come up later in the year. Um, this function here absorbs UVB and C rays. Uh, we have increasing temperature, so you can see we kind of come back this way to the warmer side after decreasing here. In the mesosphere, we get another decrease. Uh, the density of molecules continues to decrease at this, this stage, and temperature tends to drop. Uh, the thermosphere, uh, we have the highest kind of energy uh, per molecule, so we have really low density of molecules. But when those molecules are excited, um, they move in heat more quickly, and that causes this kind of rapid increase here. And um, that's why we see the temperature trend um, skyrocketing at this stage. Uh, so we absorb this high amount of UV and X-rays, and that causes these molecules to vibrate quite a bit, and that is a reason we get this massive spike here at the end. So increasing, decre decreasing, increasing, decreasing, increasing for temperature trends, and then decreasing all the way through for density of molecules. Um, the exosphere is kind of the, the transitional area between space, essentially. Um, so we just need to know troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere in order. A uh, nice, easy way to remember that is the silly mouse uh, tries to escape. All right, So that's an easy way if you're struggling remembering these things and memorizing uh, all the stuff in this unit. Um, that's a big one there. Solar radiation and unequal heating of the Earth. So what's causing, in our atmospheric layers here, and we get all this weather and, and we talk about weather and climate, what's causing all this stuff to occur? Uh, the driving force of everything that's going on here, when we talk about why this stuff is happening in our climate and our atmosphere, why is weather changing, what's going on, is all about this right here. It's the amount of solar radiation and unequal heating. All right, This is the big idea. Okay, so we live on a sphere, the sphere is tilted, and we have different uh, angles or amounts of sunlight depending on where you are on the planet uh, as we rotate around the sun. So ultimately, the more direct angle, right, the higher intensity of sunlight. So this is a more uh, intense sunlight, whereas down here, it's less, right, near the poles. Um, when we have other factors that affect how, how much sunlight is actually absorbed by the planet, things like the albedo effect. Uh, albedo is the ability of an, of an area to reflect light. So light-colored surfaces um, reflect light and have high albedo. So things like snow and ice, 
ice caps, right? Those would be examples of that. Darker colored things um, would absorb more of the sun's rays. This unequal heating is kind of a driving engine uh, as we talk about climate and weather. Another thing that we notice about the Earth is that the tilt creates these seasons. So looking at here, we think about the Earth this way when we look at it, but when we really look at it in perspective, tilted, um, this is how we orbit the sun. And because of that, we get seasons of winter and summer. Summer, this half is closer. Winter, we're tilted away. As we rotate around the sun, we get a change in season. So now the top half, the northern hemisphere, is in summer, and the bottom's in winter. Um, so you can see that the tilt of the axis uh, determines the seasons. Um, so because of that, because we're not oriented perfectly vertically, um, that's why we, we don't have kind of the same weather year-round. Um, so that also determines hours of sunlight, which affects a lot of things as well. Um, but understand that the most direct radiation is going to be at the equator. right? So we get more sunlight at the equator. This is the highest amount of insulation or sunlight per unit area. Uh, seasons are opposite in northern and southern hemisphere. So summer uh, here in the United States would be winter in somewhere like Australia. Global wind patterns is a big one. This is a draw it. Um, just so you know, the cool, dense air uh, forms these convection currents, and you're going to hear that term quite a bit. Um, cool, dense air and warm, lighter air. So what happens is when we have cool, dense air, it, it is a higher pressure thing, and it's going to drive down and sink down. Okay, so high pressure is going to want to sink down, it's cool and dense. Warm light air is low pressure and it's going to want to come up. Uh, when these two things kind of collide, they, they create this little bit of a swirl where we get the, the cool dense air pushing underneath and then helping push that low pressure warm air up around. Um, so this density difference creates uh, this thing we refer to as a convection current. Um, and this is kind of a result of the equator getting more intense sunlight and radiation. So we see things like this, like the equator uh, is going to be warmer, so it's going to want to rise up, and then air from further north comes in and sinks underneath, so we create uh, convection currents that kind of drive uh, the, the air in the atmosphere, the weather, the water vapor, all the stuff that creates our weather and climate. Uh, global wind patterns is going to be a really uh, really intense one here for you. We're going to map these things out, but when we start talking about our global wind patterns, uh, what we're looking at are being able to identify the different types of convection currents that exist. So you have three of those, so we'll start there. Um, in, it, in addition to understanding that, yeah, the unequal heating of the earth uh, changes how we get these convection currents, when we move energy around, which changes ocean and wind, uh, another thing we need to talk about is the rotation of the Earth itself. Uh, the Earth's rotation is not the same everywhere. What we mean by that is really down here when we talk about the speed of the Earth. Um, the speed of the Earth at the equator is going to rotate more quickly than up near the poles. All right? We move a little slower. So because of that, we get this thing called the Coriolis effect. And the Coriolis effect is really just referring to the fact that because the Earth is spinning, um, objects on the Earth are going to deflect in a specific direction depending on which way they were trying to move originally. Right? Kind of like if you're trying to pass a football to somebody who's moving on a merry-go-round, right? you, you would have to throw that at a different angle. Or conversely, if the person on the merry-go-round had a football, they would have to throw that um, and it would, when they did throw it, it would move. Um, so in order to hit your target, you would have to kind of adjust how you threw that. Otherwise, the ball would deflect. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the direction the air currents move is going to be something we're going to want to mark on our maps, so trade winds, westerlies, and easterlies, and I'll point those out here. So let's jump right in. First, we'll talk about those convection currents. So Hadley cell is the first one. The Hadley cells are located here and also here. Okay. So north and south of the equator are first convection currents here. We have low pressure warm air, uh, moist air rising up. This is where we get on the equator a rainforest, right? Because we get a lot of rainfall here. The air dries up, cools, and sinks at 30 degrees. Same thing over here. All right. That sinking, cooler, more dense air um, comes up right here. Uh, we also get our feral cell as the next one. 
And so we have sinking cooler dense air, but as the earth, as the air travels across the earth, it, it warms up a little bit. Um, and then we get this rising uh, low pressure, warmer air here to form a feral cell. And then we get our feral cell, our next one down here too. Uh, the last type of cells are polar cell. All right, so polar is the highest one. Uh, the higher or the lower pressure, warmer air here rises up and the cooler more dense high pressure air sinks and we get this third cell here we get a polar cell there a polar cell all the way down here all right um, next thing to point out is again the pressure um, as a result of that we get this alternating low pressure band high pressure band at 30 degrees right we got zero degrees equator is low then highs 30 then low 60 and then it ends up being high right at the the poles um, so these bands help determine things like our air currents, which are um, highlighted here. So the, we'll start near the equator. We have trade winds. All right, trade winds are ones that are equatorial, um, and these are all going to go from the east to the west. And then we have our westerlies, which means they're coming out of the west. So they go west to east, so they kind of move this way. And then we have polar easterlies, which are going to come out of the east and go to the west. All right, so all of these things are things we'll need to have labeled on our maps. Um, so let's get that taken care of. Uh, next thing is another label, these ocean currents. Um, ocean currents uh, basically are a function of uh, hot and cold water or warm and cold water. Also, uh, salty uh, concentrations do affect it as well. So cold water is more dense and sinks. Salty water is more dense and sinks, and that causes these currents to kind of turn around. So as they get colder up near the poles, um, they're a little more dense, then they start to sink, and then they um, go start to flow back down and in reverse direction, also become a little deeper. So we have uh, these basic cur currents here. Deep, cold ocean currents are deeper, and uh, warmer currents tend to be more shallow and uh, rise up here. Um, so they tend to circulate back. This is our oceanic conveyor belt. Um, they can create these gyres. So basically, uh, in specific areas in the oceans on this map, you can see these five areas of location. Um, these are five main gyres, which are kind of like a circular pattern of current that uh, can create things like a, a ocean garbage patch. If there's plastic in there, they kind of do this slow circulation. Uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation is a specific uh, weather event uh, that we need to understand. So we just need to know that basically um, the typical pattern of behavior is a neutral year, right? So this is basically looking at the Pacific Ocean. So off the coast of California, South America, um, right over here, uh, we get cool water kind of rising up. Um, so that's what we're looking at in this picture. So this is kind of cool water that upwells. We call that cool water upwelling right here uh, off the coast of South America. And that's because trade winds push the warmer surface water this way. So the trade winds are going to push the hot water over here. And then the cold, deeper water is able to upwell like this. Okay. Um, in an El Nino year, these trade winds are kind of like, meh, they're kind of weakened a little bit. They're not as strong. So more of the warm the more the warm water stays at the surface. Uh, what that does is it doesn't push all this rainfall over there, so it can lead to things like flooding and mudslides um, and more severe weather uh, in this direction in the United States, um, West Coast, and South America. And then we can get something called a La Nina year, which is the opposite of El Nino, which is when these trade winds get really strong, right? And they start to push really hard this way. Um, so now we get a lot of cooled water upwelling here. Uh, the significance of this, besides weather events, is that the cool water tends to be more nutrient dense and bring uh, more fish uh, into the area, um, that kind of thing. So it uh, creates a little bit of a disparity in biodiversity, fishing, weather events, and it can affect people um, in a negative way um, when these El Nino years uh, are more common. The last couple of things here are talking about climate and geography and just understanding that the geography, the landscape itself, much like we talked about in watersheds, affects how water moves, uh, can change how the climate uh, is a factor as well. So things like latitude or angle of insulation, we've talked a little bit about, but understanding that higher latitudes receive less sunlight, which makes them cooler, they get less precipitation versus the equator is more intense, 
higher temperature, more evaporation, more precipitation, right? That directly affects our uh, distribution of our biomes. So we talked about that. This is really where this comes in, okay? So these factors here are all about how our biomes are, are where they are on the planet. Geography also plays a role, so mountains, oceans. Uh, mountains can disrupt wind and produce this rain shadow, which we'll discuss next. And oceans can help to moderate temperatures and add moisture. Uh, so oceanic areas can be a little bit warmer um, on a coastal region, depending on the current that's there, versus something that's more inland. Uh, the last bit here is talking about rain shadows. This concept really saying that the windward side of a, a mountain range, the side the wind goes into, is going to tend to have heavier rainfall. So this would be like the windward side here, the wind direction. Um, and then the leeward side tends to be drier. So you can see this from like a Google satellite here that, you know, the wind direction, so the, the wind moves this way, it carries any moisture with it, and it's going to go ahead and dump a lot of the water here as this wind rises up over this, this mountain range, the Andes. Um, there's no more moisture left, and on the other side, it's this really dry, arid, uh, desert-type region.